Hello, welcome to today's Wilbur Series class on growing strawberries in Kentucky. First off, we're going to talk about site selection. You do want to select a deep sandy loam soil with plenty of organic matter um, with a pH of 6 to 6.5. 65 is about what our natural pHs are in here, so that's probably going to be pretty good. Uh, be sure that you do add some organic matter to your bed because strawberries really do like more of a loose, uh, loamy soil than a hard clay. They just do not like a harder clay. So even, even if you have to do a little raised bed or just get some peat or something and till into that soil to loosen it up some. You want to locate a site on a moderate slope, usually 5 to 15%. That's just going to help the colder air drain away from your uh, strawberry bed uh, if we have a late frost. That's more of a commercial situation, though. Uh, for you as a homeowner, you usually can go out and just cover your bed um, if you're going to have cold weather while they've got fruit or flower on. Also, you want to locate near a water source for irrigation. Uh, these plants cannot be dry while they're in flower and making berries because it will greatly reduce your yield. Most years in Kentucky, we're probably not going to need that extra water but it's good to have it just in case. Also, you wanna locate your bed close to the house uh, for a multitude of reasons, but mostly because you can keep an eye on it. It's easier to keep predators out of it or uh, foragers, I should say, out of it. Um, you know whenever it, the berries are ripe a lot quicker because you're gonna walk by that bed a lot and you'll see the red and you'll know when to, when to pick. Uh, and also, it's gonna make it easier if it does need irrigating or if it needs covering in frost, it's just gonna make it a lot easier if it's all close to your house. It is good to have some good site preparation uh, ahead of time, if at all possible. Um, I know that if you're just thinking about getting berries or getting strawberries right now, you maybe don't have a bed worked up, but uh, if you know ahead of time, it's good to get rid of the weeds early. Uh, a rotation uh, out of a, a crop or, or, a, or lawn is good. Also, a broad spectrum post-emergent herbicide is good the summer before just to knock those weeds out. It's also a good idea to go ahead and plow or turn that area under in the fall uh, where you can have all that, uh, any, any kind of organic matter that was on that surface left that it can, de it can decompose. Also, it's good to go ahead and get a soil test done in the fall and fertilize in the spring prior to planting based on your results. Uh, you still do have time to get your test results uh, for this spring and still go ahead and plant though. So, you still got time. Uh, and also, if, if you know ahead of time, it's good to put a cover crop down some years and turn it under. Um, and also, you're going to uh, spring disc or harrow or teal or whatever you're going to do in the spring whenever you get ready to plant. Also, you want to avoid sites that grew solanaceous or bramble crops the prior three years. Uh, solanaceous crops are tomatoes, peppers, uh, uh, potatoes, eggplant, any of those things in that, that uh, family, tobacco even, uh, because they do get verticillium and fusarium wilts. And so do um, uh, blackberries and so, so do strawberries and all those crops. So just avoid those crops that might have carried that disease uh, along in that field uh, because you don't want to start that into your new uh, strawberry crop. As far as cultivar, cultivars go, you want a uh, fruit that should have good size. Most of us don't want tiny berries. Uh, you want attractive appearance and good quality, which is what we would all want in a strawberry. Also, the, the, the things to really look for is resistance to diseases such as red steel, which is a root fungus, uh, verticillium wilts, which we talked about earlier uh, by not following those crops that might carry that uh, disease on into the field, uh, leaf spot, and then leaf scorch. Um, we can get around some of these diseases by planting resistant cultivars. Also, always buy from a reputable nursery, one that uh, the plants have been um, inspected uh, to make sure that they are free of disease and insects before they're shipped out. Uh, you're going to get dormant plants most of the time uh, as a homeowner uh, in the spring. You want to make sure that they are uh, inspected and they are uh, the top of the line plants. Uh, you want virus free plants. There's no reason to plant uh, plants that might have a problem. You're just bringing a problem into your garden. Also, plants grown north of us are usually better for us in our climate. Uh, they tend to acclimate better to the warmer than the plants grew in a colder uh, cli or warmer climate and then shipped north. So uh, usually we're going to buy these plants from uh, nurseries that are north of us, which is usually uh, like Indiana Berry or Norse Farms or some of those uh, uh, nurseries. And then one thing is cheap plants are not necessarily cheap. So just keep in mind uh, a cheap plant um, sometimes can just be a nightmare and 
cause you more headaches than you would have ever imagined uh, and more time and money than just going ahead and buying good plants to start with. As far as recommended varieties go, Early Glow is a good early uh, variety for us. It has good flavor and quality. It's got good disease resistance. Uh, Jewel is another one that produces large, firm uh, fruit, um, good color and quality. Uh, we also have AC Valley Sunset, which is also a large fruit variety. has a really good flavor compared to some of the other late season varieties. also has resistance to most of the diseases, which is very important. Um, All Star is another late mid-season. It's a good strawberry in shape. It also has really good disease resistance. Uh, if you get good disease resistance, that's going to just reduce the amount of uh, sprays that you may have to apply. Flavor Fest is also another good disease resistant. It has large sweet berries and is very good uh, yielding uh, berry for us. It is a mid-season uh, berry. Uh, Galetta is another one that's uh, an early season variety with large, firm, bright red uh, berries. It does have really high quality fruit and it does ripen a little earlier than Chandler. Um, as far as Chandler goes, it's not a great one for us to grow in the home garden um, because it has a lot more disease uh, issues than some of the other varieties. But if you've ever bought strawberries at the, um, at the grocery, they're usually going to be Chandler. Uh, there's also some new varieties out there and those that signed up for the class and paid for the plants are going to get these. Uh, Keepsake is a new one that was released by the USDA uh, in Beltsville. It's a mid-season, uh, since we're only planting one variety, I thought mid-season would be the best way to go with that. Um, it is a really good, uh, outstanding berry with high soluble solids, which is the sweetness aspect, and also a little bit of acidity, which gives you a little tart, so it gives you that little strawberry sweet tart flavor uh, in there. Um, it is very close related to Flavor Fest, which is one of the other recommended varieties for us, um, and it does, but it does have a really high shelf life, which some of the berries may not. The great thing about keepsake, though, it is resistant to anthracnose, which is the fruit rot, which we usually hit if we have wet weather. So that's really nice to have that package built into that uh, variety. Uh, I know some people have uh, grown everbearing and liked uh, everbearing strawberries, uh, but they're no longer recommended by the university because of the spotted uh, wing drosophila. That should be wing, not wind. Sorry there. Uh, but it is a fruit fly that is uh, non-native that has came into our area. Uh, and it's capable of actually laying eggs into the fruit without the fruit having a bruise or a blemish, which uh, most of the part time, uh, usually a fruit fly only uh, infects fruit that's uh, got a problem to start with, like a, a bruise or a cut or something like that. Well, the spotted wing uh, drosophila can, can lay right into that fruit, so uh, you may unwittingly eat a uh, little uh, fly larva. So just uh, right now, we're not recommending the everbearing for our area. Nurseries you can buy from uh, berry plants from, we talked about earlier, uh, Indiana Berry is where I usually buy the uh, berry plants from for my classes because they're close uh, and it's really quick shipping for, for from southern Indiana to us. Uh, we also have Lewis Nursery and Farms, which is good for uh, uh, for getting plants as well. And then Norse Farms, which is, uh, I think, out of New York or pretty far up, up north of us if you want some more northern stock. You, you can order from them. All three of these are good uh, sources for berries. So when your plants arrive, uh, if they're frozen, and believe it or not, I've ordered in bulk before, and they were frozen when they got to us, which was no problem uh, for the plants. You just want to allow them to, to thaw out. You can soak the plants for a couple of hours uh, in some cool water, cold water. Um, I just waited uh, for them to thaw out on their own in the fridge because uh, we didn't need them for a couple of days. Um, if you can't plant right away, you can heal the plants in if you've got a lot and you can't go into a refrigerator, but generally speaking, the best uh, way to keep them and uh, before you plant, if you don't have uh, uh, time to plant them or your ground's not ready or whatever, you can just leave them in the plastic bag they come in or you can wrap, wrap them in um, a plastic grocery bag and just fold them over, stick them in the fridge, uh, and they'll be good for a couple of weeks. Um, watch for mold. Um, if they get too too much condensation, you can start a little mold. But for the most part, they'll hold uh, you know pr pretty well in the in the refrigerator. The best temperature is about 35 degrees. I know most of our refrigerators are not quite that cold, uh, but that's fine. If you got it down to 40, they're going to be pretty good in there. When to plant is usually early spring for us, and that what that means is usually early March through April. Um, I wouldn't want really to go much later than that because you want the plants to get established a little bit, uh, the root system established a little bit, while the weather's still cool before we start getting those 85 and 90 degree days and 
you'll have to start watering and, and all that those kinds of things so if you go ahead and put them out now they've got about a month before it gets, starts to really warm up uh, and, and they can get established uh, a lot easier that way with less help from you as far as planting you do want to prune the plants roots some of these are going to have really long roots some of them are going to be at different uh, sizes and shapes do prune them don't worry about that a little bit of pruning is not going to hurt them it's just going to cause them to uh, uh, branch out a little uh, faster than they would if you didn't trim them so it's going to be just fine um, keep the plant roots moist while you're planting especially if you have a lot to to plant you don't want to leave a bunch of them out in the uh, sun to dry while you're planting planting the others so uh, keep them covered and shaded uh, most of us are going to plant these by hand uh, commercial people are going to plant them with a setter of some sort but we're going to plant them by hand as home uh, gardeners um, one thing to keep in uh, uh, our think about is if you look at this picture here a is the proper uh, planting uh, they've trimmed the roots off a little bit they're even um, and they're spread out in the soil notice the soil line is right halfway up the crown or right at the crown that's perfect uh, depth uh, if you look at B they planted it too deep uh, they didn't spread the roots out either um, and that's probably gonna rot because that crowns under the soil line and then C is planted too high it's gonna dry out and it's gonna have a hard time they also didn't trim the roots so you got some roots that are really long and scraggly and some of them they're shorter uh, and then D uh, they just bent the roots over and stuck them in a hole and didn't really spread them out it's it's gonna be a lot better for that plant it's gonna get, get established a lot better if you've got those roots spread a little bit um, so that's just a little things to keep in mind there on planting uh, A is the way you want to go the first year you do want to amend your soil based on your soil test recommendations we recommend that with all plants if you had a recommend a soil test last year it sh still should be good for this year for that area if it's in the same area uh, one month after planting uh, you do want to side dress with <clears throat> one pound uh, per hundred feet of row of urea um, that's usually uh, not a lot but but you know that little bit of extra nitrogen does help that actually if, if you didn't have urea and you had triple ten that amounts to about five pounds of triple ten to give you that same amount of, amount of nitrogen that extra phosphorus and potassium won't hurt uh, but I wouldn't say you're wasting it unless uh, if you didn't need it and then you're not it's in your soil it's not going anywhere but um, it would serve you better to put it in an area that might already need more phosphorus and potassium then you're going to side dress again in July and if it doesn't rain you're going to want to water that in plant spacing depends on most uh, most often on what space you have and, and how much uh, input you want to put to keep the weeds and other things out of it but generally speaking especially I mean this, this chart is for commercial purposes but it gives you an idea of how far the plant should be spaced so if your row width is four feet the distance in the rows should be two feet so you're playing the plants two feet apart in your row if your rows are four feet apart so if you have a four foot bed generally speaking you're going to put a row down the middle of that uh, uh, plants so that way it's going to give enough uh, space for them to spread out and grow runners and those kinds of things um, if it's four foot uh, in a row you can also go two and a half it's up to you uh, if it's three and a half you can still go two so it just depends on, on what you want to do um, and, and how many plants you have uh, but don't put them too close give them some room give them a little room to grow uh, but you don't want to put them too far apart either because then you're weeding a lot of larger area than you really need to as far as care um, you do want to cultivate frequently especially those first year or so to make sure you keep the weeds off of these while they're getting established uh, also you're going to plant these and some of these plants are going to try to bloom pinch those blooms off you don't want them trying to produce a few strawberries while they're trying to get their root systems established and to grow some and they're trying to grow some uh, runners so go ahead and pinch those out that's going to build a stronger plant which is going to give you a better harvest the following season also you want to trim back late forming runners those are the ones that will come out sometime maybe even in September go ahead and just trim those off because they're probably not going to survive the winter and there's no reason for that plant to uh, put energy into growing those runners they're not going to survive when it could put energy into that root system and that crown that plant uh, and making a, a beefier plant which is going to give you a lot more strawberries uh, come spring Uh, as far as uh, planting uh, care you do want to irrigate during dry times generally speaking we don't have that much dry weather during the spring while these are growing and actively uh, producing berries but you do especially want to flower or, or water if they are flowering or 
um, are actively making berries because if you don't, you can get much uh, reduced yield and reduced size on those berries. Uh, you do want to mulch for winter protection. Um, that's usually straw a few inches thick. Um, we'll talk about that in just a little bit more in a few slides. Why would you want to mulch your plants after you plant? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but it pre prevents frost heaving, uh, which is the plant, um, the ground freezes and thaws, and over time it pushes those uh, plants out of the ground, especially if not rooted in really well. Um, the straw can also help re retard spring growth, which is good. Um, that'll keep them from coming out too early, getting killed by late frost and freezes. Uh, the mulch can also protect your blooms um, from spring frost. I know we mulch over in the winter, but if you keep that handy, you can throw it back over the plants if we have a late frost or freeze uh, for a night or two, and then they'll protect those plants. The biggest thing as far as during the growing season, having mulch around the plants, though, is it reduces weed growth, which most of the time that's the biggest issue with strawberries is keeping the weeds out of the beds. Um, the mulch also will conserve water to keep you from watering if we have a dry summer. Uh, because remember, we still have to water these during the summer if it gets really dry because these plants, uh, you know, if they, if the bigger the plant uh, that overwinters, the more berries you're going to get. So you want to make sure they stay healthy during the growing season as well. Um, also, another thing about mulch is it makes picking pleasant. What do I mean by that? It just means that it keeps the soil from splashing up onto the berries. And it's a lot more pleasant experience picking clean berries and going in the house and rinsing those off. Uh, rather than having to really wash those berries to get mud uh, and debris that splashed up on them from uh, a recent rain. I know I just mentioned the uh, mulch keeps the uh, berries clean, but again, just to reiterate that on another slide, here it is. Also, you do want to use clean straw. You can use wheat, you can use oat, or you can use rye. Um, you could use hay, but I wouldn't recommend it because there's so many weed seeds in it. And what do I say about clean wheat, uh, oat, and rye straw? By clean, it shouldn't have any weeds in it, and it shouldn't have any seed heads in it, or any seeds in it. Because if you put wheat down, it's got a lot of seeds in it, you're going to end up with a wheat bed, and you're going to have to pull all that out. So if you can find clean uh, wheat, oat, or rye straw, that's going to be your best bet. More on mulching, you want to plow when temperatures approach about 20 degrees. Uh, so this is your winter mulching, not your spring mulching. This is the mulch that you would put over the entire planting. Usually, when we get down to around 20 is when you want to go ahead and put that down, uh, on to, over your plants, but that generally means the plants have gone from a green to a gray color. Um, it, I used to, and we all used to think around Thanksgiving we'd get that cold, which is about the time to cut the hybrid tea roses back and all that. Well, the weather pattern has warmed, and I don't think we got in that 20 degree mark uh, last year until probably up into January. So uh, just keep in mind that, that that window there could fluctuate. So be ready um, by Thanksgiving, but sometimes they're not uh, dormant yet if we've not had any cold weather, so you don't want to cover them yet. Uh, as far as if you've had a large planting, it's about one and a half to two tons of an acre of straw that you would put on by hand, uh, a manure spreader or even a mulching machine. Generally for a homeowner, it's going to be just a bale. Uh, it's going to be plenty for most of our uh, small strawberry beds. Um, you do need to be able to see a few leaves through the mulch, so don't put it so thick that you can't see any plants because you can smother the plants and they can rot during the winter. So you scattered over uh, enough that you can still see some leaves through the straw. That's just going to be enough to give it a little bit of blanket and a little cover uh, to moderate the, the heaving and to keep that crown from freezing out. Some critical temperatures for your strawberry buds, flowers, and fruits. Uh, this is good, especially in the spring, whenever they're flowering, to know whether you're going to need to cover and what you need to do. Um, so you think about the, the buds are just starting to emerge. They're hardy down to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, when the buds close, uh, it's about 22 to 27. And then when your flowers are actually open, it's about 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for them to freeze. Uh, and then if you've got small green fruit already on, it's about 28. I know these temperatures are like, oh, just... 30 degrees. What if it's 31? They'll still freeze. No, one or two degrees can make a difference whether you have enough, you get a crop or you don't. So just keep that in mind. Um, if they're giving you, uh, they're saying it's going to get down to 31 or 32 and your flowers are open, go ahead and cover. Uh, hedge your bets there. Don't, don't take a chance on a couple degree miss on the temperature and losing your crop. As far as frost protection, uh, it is important to have. 
you need to know that the first flowers to bloom produce the largest fruit. So if those first flowers are the earliest ones and they freeze off, then you've lost your, your largest berries, uh, which is a considerable amount of your harvest. Uh, also, the flower buds lose their hardiness as they develop. So the older that uh, bud is and closer it's to opening or even open, it is more prone to frost injury. So keep that in mind. Uh, in the picture here, there's a remake fabric or floating row cover, whatever you want to call it. That is really good at protecting your uh, strawberry plants. Uh, but if you put this on, keep in mind, you need to put it on during the day while the sun is out because that sun will heat that up underneath that fabric and that residual heat will keep that temperature up during the night. Also, if you use these fabrics, make sure that that fabric goes all the way down to the ground, all the way around the bed or the plant. Even if you're using it for a tree cover or something, it needs to go all the way down to the ground where you can get that residual heat from the ground to keep that temperature up a few degrees and keep the plant from freezing. Uh, overhead irrigation is something they use down in the south, especially in the larger growing areas. It's not something we're probably going to use, but it's it's interesting to really to think about. So as far as using water for frost protection, um, as water freezes, it releases heat and maintains flower temperature at 32 degrees. Just think of it this way. Um, ice inside of ice is 32 degrees. The air temperature may be minus 14. So uh, if Earlier, uh, the flower bud was safe at 30 degrees. Well, if it's frozen with ice on it, it's 32. So it's still uh, safe inside of that uh, little capsule of ice. So how do they do this? Um, well, first, the wind can counteract the heat by evaporating the water, which can reduce your temperature. So they need a calm night if they're going to use water. Also, the sprinkling uh, has to start when the temperature reaches 34 degrees. Uh, and then you want to continue until all the ice on the blossoms is melted the next morning. So the night uh, temperature hits 34, they know it's going to get down to 30. They're going to go ahead and start sprinkling at 34. They're going to keep it on all night, let the ice build up on the plants, and then they got to keep it on all day the next day until it melts all the ice back off the plant. So it's going to take a lot of water to keep that uh, system up. That's why most of us as homeowners are never going to do that. Um, another way you can do as a homeowner, again, you can use your uh, straw and pull that straw back over the plants just to help uh, protect them and keep that residual heat right at the ground level under that straw to keep them from freezing. You can use the tobacco canvas we talked about earlier, um, or you can even, if you want, which you've got to be careful if you use plastic, you can put plastic over the bed, but you don't put the plastic on while the sun's out because it can get too hot. So just before the sun goes down, pull plastic over the bed and put some kind of heat source under there. Uh, the old fashioned Christmas lights are good. Um, some of the, um, the incandescent bulbs, if you can still find them are great. Um, they're hard to find uh, nowadays because they've all went to LED. LED is not going to give you a lot of uh, heat, so it's not going to be a great source. Um, they also make little heating cables. You could even set um, a, a couple of five gallon buckets of water in there that's warmed up and that residual heat um, will give off at night and hold, a, hold you a couple degree temperature uh, under that plastic. This is just a picture of a frost damage of a flower bud. You can see that flower is black inside. The petals are already burned and fell off. Um, the other ones are just opening, but that's just the difference in, in stage there of development. It was opened. Uh, it had its least hardy. This what was open like that and it froze. The other ones were, were still closed, so they were protected by their own little sepals and petals and it didn't freeze. So that is an example of just a critical uh, temperature difference there of just a couple degrees of a bud making it and a bud uh, getting free, frozen out. On your strawberry harvest, you're not going to get any harvest the first year after planting uh, in this matted row system or regular uh, backyard uh, strawberry production. Um, there is a system in pl on plastic that a lot of people have done, um, but commercially it usually is just a, a single planting and it's ripped out each year. Um, you can plant on plastic at home and try to get more than one year uh, out of it, and it is, it is possible. Uh, harvest begins usually in May and lasts about two or three weeks, depending on uh, the um, variety and if it's early, mid-season, or late. Um, it is heaviest in the first four to six days, and then it, then it kind of uh, dwindles down uh, finally to, to nothing. The berries usually ripen 28 to 30 days after uh, the first bloom. So when you see that first bloom, you know that you're going to be getting berries in about a month. Uh, another thing is to keep on your picking schedule. Don't let them over ripen. They don't keep long and you just run a higher chance of getting some insects and diseases in there uh, if you don't keep them picked regularly. Usually during the season, that may be up to every other day. 
far as renovating the bed, uh, this would be your second season uh, after planning this year. You need to determine whether your planning is worth renovating. Uh, generally, um, it's about three years before it's ripped out and redone completely. Uh, but you do, you can apply um, after after harvest. You can apply 2,4-D, uh, which is a broadleaf uh, herbicide. Which strawberries are broadleaf, so you got to make sure that you get the amine formula there. You'll see that in the parentheses. You have to have the amine formula, or you'll kill your strawberries too. This, now, this chemical is probably going to make your strawberries a little sick, but it's going to knock those broadleaf weeds out of there uh, that have already gotten started. Then four to five days after uh, your 2,4-D application, you're going to mow the bed down. You're going to fertilize uh, with uh, 50 to 60 pounds an acre of nitrogen. Um, if you don't have an acre of strawberries planted, uh, then you're going to go with about a half a pound of urea per 1,000 square feet. Next, you're going to go ahead and cut your row width, which your, your bed was planted. Uh, you can see there they ran uh, past where you wanted them. You need to get the tiller out. You're going to till down each side of that and get them back into the row that they should have been to start with. Uh, and then you're wanting to go throw a little bit of soil up on those crowns. Usually if you till close, that's going to throw a little bit off to the side, and that's good. That'll be just enough just to help uh, get that crown rejuvenated a little bit. You also want to go ahead and thin your plants uh, in your row to five to six inches. So you can see they're doing a wide row there, but there's some plants going to have to come out of there because some of them are just too close. And they do need five or six inches of grow room in between there. Uh, and then what you can do next is cultivate uh, to keep the weeds out um, as the plants regrow. Um, if you're a commercial grower, there are plant, uh, uh, chemicals out there to keep the plants from running so many runners. Uh, Devernol inhibits runners. Sinbar provides long-term uh, uh, control of runners. As homeowners, we're just going to go out there and if we get too many runners, just go out there and clip them off and get rid of them. You can get your bed too thick pretty quick if you just let all the runners run, and then that's going to reduce your strawberry um, production. Also, you want to make sure you irrigate, especially after your application of herbicides, uh, especially if we have dry conditions. If you have too dry of soil, the plants are not actively growing, which means the 2,4-D won't be able to kill the weeds. So you may want to go ahead and water the bed, especially if it's dry, uh, a day or so. Um, before or after your application, uh, just to make sure that that 2,4-D is actually going to get activated. Your strawberry spray schedule, most of us probably don't spray much of anything on our backyard strawberry beds, but if you do, these are the timings of what you should spray. Um, so if it's pre-bloom, which is right before bloom, you may, may need thiodan or seven, uh, and that's usually going to be to control your aphids, weevils, or spittle bugs, which I'll show you pictures of these just in a minute. Well, not aphids, but weevils and spittle bugs. Uh, and then maybe another application, if needed, for, uh, for your plant bugs or your crown borer, which the crown borer and the spittle bug are, and the weevil are the same insect. There's two different uh, uh, generations of it. And then during bloom, uh, you may need two sprays, and that's going to be Captan for your fruit rots and leaf spots, uh, or Therum, but Captan is going to be the easiest one for us to get. And remember, you just spray no insecticides while the plants are in flower because you do not want to kill your pollinators. Uh, after flower, uh, you can then spray with seven uh, again if needed uh, to stop the spittle bugs or the plant bugs. And then if you have leaf spot, you can go ahead and spray another application of Captan for those. And then after harvest, um, I would probably wait until after I regenerated or redid the bed. And then if I had leaf spots on the new growth, I would go ahead and then give another application of Captan if needed. With all that said, most of the time, Personally, I have sprayed none of these on my strawberries and still had a pretty good crop. This is the spittle bug. You can see at the top is the adult. It kind of looks like a little leaf hopper. And then at the bottom are the nymph stage. And you can see all that spit that they live in. Uh, usually, if you have more than a couple in a square foot, uh, they recommend you go ahead and spray uh, for them. Uh, they do suck juice out of the plant. And then they make this spittle for them to, to live in because they are soft-bodied in kind of a wet little... Uh, uh, insect when they're uh, uh, in their uh, uh, baby stage, but uh, go ahead and spray and get rid of those if you see very many of them. Some years these are really bad, some years they're not. Then we have the slugs, which also are one of those pests that can be hit or miss. Uh, if we have a wet spring, they're probably going to be a lot worse. Um, the easiest way to get rid of these is not by one of the chemicals we talked about earlier, but by slug bait. Uh, and you know, to, 
if you've got very many slugs out there, you can get slug bait sprinkled through your bed. Um, it's an attractant. They'll come to it and they'll eat it and they're usually gone within a couple days. You can also do the beer uh, method if you want to try to be organic, uh, which is basically bearing a coffee can down to uh, ground level and then pouring a beer in it. Uh, it's the malt that they're interested in and they'll come to it and they'll fall in a drown. Uh, for the most part, though, the uh, beer can or beer method is going to kill some of them, but it may not get them all out of the entire bed like slug bait would. And you don't want to pick berries with slugs on them that, and the berries are half eaten and rotted. This is the strawberry root weevil. The picture at the top is the, the adult and you can see the little circular notch out of the leaf that it feeds on. As an adult, it's really not that big a pest on strawberry, but it's at that nymph stage or that larval stage there at the bottom is the problem. Uh, it is a little grub that burrows into the crown of the plant and the crown of the plant uh, dies and rots. So if you've got a lot of these, it can cause a lot of damage. Uh, the way you tell whether you need to spray for these or not, though, is if you've got a lot of leaves, those little notches uh, cut out, those semicircles out of it, uh, just go ahead and spray with seven and then you can wipe those out. Another common uh, pest for strawberries is the sap beetle. Uh, it, the bottom picture makes it look quite like it's quite big, but it's not. It's quite tiny. You can see the one on the strawberry up there. You're going to see these most years. Uh, they do t drink sap out of the fruit um, and you'll see these on the other crops as well. Uh, if you have a lot of these, you're probably going to have to spray uh, with seven or something to wipe those out. Some years they're really bad, some years they're not. It's going to be one of those things that you won't know until you get in there and start picking your first uh, few berries. We have leaf blights. Uh, leaf blights are generally going to be something you're going to see periodically. Um, you, you can spray a cap tan to stop most of these blights. Uh, if it gets this bad, this is probably after harvest. It, this is whenever you're going to mow this down, get that debris out of there rejuvenate your bed and then the new growth comes out you're going to go ahead and hit it with some cap tan to, to stop that blight this is just a picture of a strawberry flower and as a reminder to know that the pollinators do help make you get berries because they are pollinating these flowers for you so never spray an insecticide uh, while your plants are in flower you want to harvest your strawberries as soon as the berries begin to ripen um, just keep in mind the warmer the temperature the less time they will keep so uh, as soon as you pick them you want to get them into a cold storage which is your refrigerator uh, just put them in a ziploc and put them in the fridge if you're going to want to eat them fresh um, they do store better at uh, or the longest at a 33 to 35 fahrenheit uh, that's still a little colder than most refrigerators at home uh, but they'll still keep uh, keep quite well in, in a regular temperature refrigerator uh, you do want your humidity about 90 to 95 percent Ziploc works pretty good for that uh, and you can store them for up to seven days usually in the fridge um, and you can also go ahead and wash them uh, and destem them and freeze them whole and then you can make jams and jellies anytime you want to or shortcake or whatever uh, later in the season when maybe you have more time uh, to, to deal with those berries. If you have any questions you can call me at the Washington County Extension Office at 859-336-7741. Happy gardening!